My name is Megan. I've been married for 10 years and am now in my early 40s. We don't have any children, but my life with my beloved husband, Kevin, is very peaceful and blissful. Kevin is a typical company employee without any major changes in his life and five years older than me. But since I'm working part-time, our two-person household has a reasonable amount of financial leeway, allowing us some luxuries. Our married life has been smooth without any major ups and downs. However, a minor incident started causing ripples in our tranquil daily life. This incident involved the news of my beloved father's death and inheriting his apartment. When we got married, my father started living alone in a new, modern, two-bedroom apartment he had purchased. On the other hand, Kevin and I lived in my childhood home, a four-bedroom apartment filled with memories. This childhood home was transferred to me from my father when I got married. Before that, my father, mother, and I used to live there. When I got married, my father gave it to me with his blessings for our happiness. He suggested, why not start your new life in this home? I was elated by his offer. Later on, when my father passed away, I inherited the new two-bedroom apartment he was living in. I was very fond of that apartment, so I decided to rent it out immediately. However, one day, during a conversation with my in-laws, an unexpected suggestion came up. Sarah and her children are living in a small place. How about they move to Megan's four-bedroom apartment? Sarah is Kevin's younger sister who was divorced and raising three kids. They were living in a two-bedroom apartment, which might be a bit tight for them. But, to be honest, my relationship with Sarah has not been great. Every time we met, she would make slightly sarcastic remarks about us not having children yet. Kevin and I decided to get married when we were just under 30. Since then, Sarah started to make pointed remarks. After crossing 30, her comments became even more hurtful. Remarks like, you're already past 30 and you still have no kids? Or aren't you seen as less of a woman without children? Were thrown in jest. But what shocked me the most was an incident after my beloved father passed away. Sarah said, it's a pity you couldn't show your father the face of his grandchild. It was a moment that left me cold. Sarah is actually three years older than me. Instead of a younger sister-in-law, she's more like an older one. We've always tried to treat her as family and interacted with her amicably. But after such remarks, I naturally built a wall in my heart against her. I'm an only child and my only family was my father. Amidst the grief of losing him, Sarah's words were truly shocking. Time had passed since my father's death and I hadn't seen Sarah for a while. But out of the blue, my mother-in-law made a surprising proposal. Sarah says she'll pay $500 in rent each month. Looking at my mother-in-law's smug face, I was so shocked that I couldn't say anything. The apartment we lived in was a bit old, but we had taken good care of it, so it was still in a usable condition. There was a big shopping mall nearby, and we could easily take trains and buses. So, if we were to rent out this apartment, I thought it wouldn't go for less than $2,000 a month. But $500? I was truly surprised. Do they even understand the going rate for this area? It's unthinkable for this spacious four-bedroom apartment's monthly rent to be just $500. Maybe they had assumed that I had agreed because I didn't say anything? My mother-in-law seemed very enthusiastic about the idea. You guys already have another apartment, right? You can just live there. Even if you don't renew the lease, later on, Sarah and the others will move there, so it's fine. How long is the contract term? Kevin was also very excited, saying, that's really a great idea. The place where your father lived is new and lovely, and it's perfect for just the two of us. At this rate, I felt like the conversation was progressing without considering our opinions, and I started to panic. I couldn't help but blurt out, isn't there an option for all of us to live together in this apartment? My in-law's house was big and they were the only ones living there. Rooms for Kevin and Sarah are also available, so I thought it would be no problem if they moved in. After all, they've said they want to live in a bigger place. Normally, before making such moves, you would consult with your family, I think. 
However, moving to the in-laws would mean the kids changing schools, and they seem concerned about the hassle and cost of buying new school uniforms and gym clothes. I was hesitant to clearly express my reluctance to rent to Sarah in front of my mother-in-law, but I told her, this place is my hometown. I can't just leave easily. I left their house that day, but my mother-in-law said, you don't have to decide right away, which made me feel she hasn't given up. When I returned home, I asked Kevin, this apartment is precious to us? Why are you deciding so easily to leave? He looked surprised and responded, well, it's not a single family home. I was a bit shocked by his reply. Perhaps because he grew up in a single family home, an apartment doesn't feel like a real home to him. But I wish he could at least apologize for not understanding my feelings. Upset, I raised my voice. It's my home, my apartment. Why are you deciding things without consulting me? Kevin looked upset. We've been married for 10 years. Why do you say my apartment? It's our apartment. His voice contained a hint of anger. I wished he could understand how I feel about this apartment as a my cherished home. If he had hesitated to rent the apartment to his sister, I might not have felt hurt by his words our place. But at that moment, I felt hurt. We tried to calmly discuss it many times after that, but it wasn't easy. Kevin seemed not to understand my feelings at all, and I got words like money-minded, stubborn, and selfish thrown at me. As time passed and the seasons changed, the wall between us remained unchanged. During that time, I kept receiving messages from my mother-in-law, asking if the discussions about living together were progressing. The pressure from my mother-in-law and Kevin, who wouldn't understand my perspective, slowly wore me down. I felt I was reaching my breaking point. One day, I was shocked to receive an email from Sarah. It says, why are you two, without kids, hesitating to move out of such a small space? You don't need that big of a place. Just leave. I hadn't heard from Sarah since our discussions about the apartment. And yet, here she was, out of the blue, telling me to leave. I never imagined I'd receive such a direct email. Reading that message, I reflected on how much I had endured and felt deep self-loathing. The idea of divorce crossed my mind several times. I tried to calm myself each time, but I felt like I was at my limit. I decided to go to the local government office to initiate divorce proceedings. I also decided to reach out to a specific place for the next steps. A few days later, with a renewed mindset, I visited the court. Upon checking, it turned out that both the apartment I lived in and the one I was renting out were all under my name. It was my apartment. Confirming this fact, I decided to confront my relationship with my husband and thought about what I should do next. I wanted to thoroughly discuss everything with him. I've told you many times, this is my house. I just can't stand the idea of renting this apartment to Sarah. I don't want to rent my home to someone who belittles and looks down on me. Please persuade your mother and Sarah, I said. Kevin's face darkened, looking like he was thinking this topic again. I had told Kevin about all the harassment I received from Sarah and how much I disliked her. I wanted him to understand my feelings, but the outcome was different. Kevin sided with Sarah, saying, Sarah is right. In hindsight, I could have gotten a divorce at that point, saving myself from this anguish. But I couldn't tend a relationship that had lasted for 10 years so easily. If Kevin rejected my proposal, I was prepared to divorce. Deep down, I felt that way. Maybe you're just being overly sensitive about Sarah? Perhaps you feel she's being condescending, but maybe you're exaggerating things. I really don't understand why you feel this way, Kevin said, making light of my feelings without knowing the whole story. His words stung. Was I the only one feeling like this? If that's the case, will you sign this? I presented him with the divorce papers. A look of shock appeared in Kevin's eyes, but he immediately said, Do you really feel that way? You want to end our relationship over such a trivial matter? I'm serious. I care about Sarah too, and I always wanted to be with you. But recently, our relationship feels different. I don't feel the love anymore, so I'm leaving. I said while looking into his eyes. My heart ached at Kevin's attitude. 
His casual smile hinted that he didn't grasp the gravity of my feelings, and I felt a tear threatening to spill. I wished he would leave sooner rather than later. Maybe Sarah and your mother don't necessarily want to get along with you. Have you ever considered that because you always think about yourself? That's why our relationship is like this. Kevin said in a slightly softer tone. This is how we always were, misunderstanding each other even while trying to care for one another. Look, I think it might be impossible to fix our relationship, no matter how much we talk. I feel there's still a distance between our hearts. I can't even imagine a future with you anymore. If you won't respond to my feelings, then we'll have to take legal action, I explained slowly. Kevin, with a mix of surprise and sadness on his face, quivered, do you really feel that way? Afterwards, he left the house without a word. He probably didn't want to talk anymore and just wanted to escape the situation. He hadn't signed the divorce papers, and he left his belongings behind. A few days later, Kevin returned. His eyes looked sad and somewhat wary. What should we do from here? He gently asked. He might think I'd forgive him if he humbled himself, but everything is already settled. There's nothing left to discuss. If you agree to the divorce, sign these documents. If you can't, then we'll have to seek legal action. And also, I'm letting go of this house, I said. Actually, I had been considering selling the house for some time. The day I went to get the documents, I had consulted with Mr. Thomas, an old friend of my father's. I've known him since I was a child. He was by my father's side until his last day. Mr. Thomas, who attended my father's funeral, gave me his business card and asked to be contacted if any problems arose. The card listed his law firm's details. With Mr. Thomas' introduction, I was fortunate to get assistance from a judicial scrivener regarding the inheritance my father left behind. When I told Mr. Thomas about my situation, he gave sincere advice. He informed me about the importance of verifying ownership, handling complications in divorce negotiations, and other helpful tips. Thanks to his advice, I could protect myself. After Kevin temporarily left the house, I decided to sell the apartment. I quickly reached out to real estate agents and informed them of my intentions to sell. I also informed Mr. Thomas about the deteriorating relationship with Kevin, his refusal to sign the divorce papers, and sought his support for the divorce procedures. When Kevin found out about the sale of the apartment, he reacted with both shock and anger. You always said this was our family home. Are you really planning to let go of such an important place? And after being so concerned about Sarah, you're truly selfish. But his words no longer unsettled me. Do you have anything else to say? I asked, looking him straight in the eyes and took a deep breath. He was momentarily taken aback but quickly began to assert his views. Why would you decide such an important matter on your own? The apartment might be in your name, but after a divorce, there should be a division of property. This apartment is the property of both of us who live here, right? Kevin became emotional and pleaded with desperation. In response, I gave him a slight smile and replied, Actually, this apartment has been under my name even before we got married. I've already checked with my lawyer and any property acquired before marriage is not subject to property division. Selling the apartment, of course, had its resistance, but I didn't want to leave behind more painful memories in this place. With the information about property division from Mr. Thomas, I decisively chose to sell. Kevin, upon learning the truth, suddenly changed his attitude. I'm sorry, this place is special to you. But it hasn't been sold yet, right? Please reconsider. Why don't we give it another shot together? I'll explain things to Sarah and mom. Please, just stop the divorce and the apartment sale. In his words, I questioned myself why I had stayed with him for 10 long years. I'm dumbfounded that I chose someone like him. Don't put on a nice face now. When we were together, you never once took my side, did you? Thinking of starting over with you now is unfathomable. So please, leave. We both need a fresh start. He wasn't easily convinced, creating a vast rift between us. But after navigating through various procedures, I finally managed to end our relationship. 
It's the beginning of a new life. The idea of being alone was initially daunting, but I realized it isn't as scary as it seemed. Now, I live in a new two-bedroom apartment, living life on my terms.